The European Space Agency's automated transfer vehicle has a crucial role in maintaining human spaceflight operations on the International Space Station, humanity's permanent outpost in space. Each ATV is named after a scientist or individual who fundamentally changed the way in which we understand the universe. And this series of films aims to examine these scientific breakthroughs and visionary concepts that made history. If one physicist had to be selected whose speculations have most transformed our understanding of the cosmos, it would be difficult not to choose Albert Einstein. Born in 1879 in the German town of Ulm, his work on the photoelectric effect won him the 1921 Nobel Prize for Physics and laid the framework for the quantum theory of matter but it was his speculations on the nature of light, mass, gravity, and time that forever changed humanity's view of nature. Einstein's name is most synonymous with the theories of special and general relativity. But what does relativity mean from a physics perspective? To understand the power of Einstein's insights, we must first explore the world as modelled by the Italian astronomer and physicist Galileo Galilei in 1632. Galileo was intrigued by how observations conducted by different experimental observers would be perceived by those observers. And it's the concept of different observers and their measurements that is central to relativity. Let's carry out an imaginary experiment, a thought experiment, in which a train is moving at a constant velocity. A scientist on board, we'll call him observer one, wants to measure the speed of an object moving in the train carriage. In his experiment, he rolls a ball along the floor and measures its speed from his perspective. The train carriage makes up what in physics terms we call an inertial or non-accelerating frame of reference. Now, imagine another observer, two, who's standing alongside the train track in a different inertial frame. This observer is watching the experiment as the train carriage rolls by. Galileo reasoned that, from the stationary observer's perspective, the velocity of the rolling ball is easy to calculate. It's just the velocity of the ball as the train scientist measures it, added to the velocity of the train carriage with respect to the stationary observer. This is what Galileo thought of as relativity and it implied that all motion in the universe was in relation to an absolute framework of space and time. Translating between different inertial frames was easy, just a matter of adding or subtracting relative velocities, and this tied in with most people's everyday experiences. In this Galilean relativity, although two observers might have different measurements for the speed of the ball relative to them, both observers would agree that the time interval that the ball took to cross the carriage was the same. Galilean relativity would suggest that different inertial observers would measure light traveling at different speeds, depending on their own relative velocities. Imagine a spaceship which has a laser on board. The laser fires a beam of light, which travels at 300,000 kilometers per second relative to the spaceship. 
Now, this spaceship is itself moving at 100,000 kilometers per second relative to another observer. Then surely that observer should measure the speed of the beam as being 400,000 kilometers per second. This is what Galilean relativity and common sense would imply. But it isn't what actually happens. In fact, both observers measure the speed of light as being the same 300,000 kilometers per second, regardless of their relative velocity. The speed of light in the universe is the same for all observers. Einstein realized that the only way to mathematically model this was to start with the observed constant speed of light and to change the way in which different inertial observers measure space and time. He needed to change, to make relative, that which Galilean relativity had made absolute, the relationship between space and time. Imagine we have a clock that works by firing a laser pulse across a set distance to a mirror. In this clock, each time the beam returns to the source, we have one tick. The clock operator sees the beam moving back and forth in a straight line in his frame of reference. Imagine that this laser clock is itself moving at high speed with respect to another observer. From this second observer's perspective, the path of the laser beam during each tick isn't a straight line. It's actually longer diagonal lines caused by the relative motion of the clock. And since light can only travel at this constant speed, the time interval for each tick on an apparent moving clock must be greater than the time interval for each tick on an apparent static clock. Einstein had broken the three century old paradigm of absolute space and time in his new theory of special relativity, showing that the way we measure a time interval depends on our relative motion. From the point of view of a stationary observer, a clock that's moving seems to run slower than a clock that's stationary. And the faster the clock is moving relative to us, the more dramatic this relative time dilation actually becomes. Now this seems contrary to all our everyday experience. My watch doesn't seem to lose time after I've run down the street but the mathematics needed to derive the time dilation factor is a simple application of Pythagoras' principle to our laser pulse model. And what it shows is that the time dilation effect only really manifests itself at incredibly high relative velocities, those close to the speed of light. And when it does, the consequences are dramatic. Einstein's other great breakthrough, general relativity, which he published in 1915, owes its origins to an epiphany he had in 1907. Going back to the experiment I mentioned earlier of the train carriage moving at constant speed, Einstein realized that scientists conducting investigations in a constantly accelerating spaceship would get the same results as those they'd have if they'd conducted their experiments on a planet with a gravity field that produced the same acceleration. This is the equivalence principle. The effects of gravity fields are indistinguishable from the effects of acceleration. Why was this so revolutionary? Imagine we're in a spaceship, accelerating upwards. In the cabin, we fire 
a laser. Every second, our spaceship travels an increasing distance upwards because it's accelerating. So if we look at the effect this has on the beam of light as seen within the cabin, its path will appear to be curved, a parabola. And since the effects of gravity are indistinguishable from those of acceleration, Einstein realized that light, although massless, would curve in a gravity field. This theory was spectacularly confirmed by Sir Arthur Eddington during observations of a solar eclipse in May 1919. In fact, Einstein showed that all of the phenomena we traditionally associate with gravity fields could be replicated by instead thinking of how mass distorts the structure of space and time itself. Light follows not straight line paths, but the local curvature of space-time produced by the presence of mass. Einstein conducted another thought experiment in which light was fired upwards from Earth. The photons must, from the perspective of an observer higher in the gravity field, lose energy to climb higher. And they do so through a lengthening of their wavelength and a reduction in their measured frequency, a gravitational redshift. This implies that the same photon event will appear to have different wavelengths, depending on the position of the observer in the gravity field. Imagine a laser located deep in the Earth's gravity field and fired upwards. This laser has a characteristic wavelength, frequency and energy. From the perspective of our alien observer, however, at a higher position in the gravity field, the emitted photon will have its wavelength stretched by gravitational redshift as it climbs to a higher level, just like the wave on this rubber band. If the alien now points its laser downwards, as the alien's photons fall deeper into the gravity field towards Earth, their wavelength will be reduced and undergo gravitational blue shift. These effects have profound implications for our understanding of the effect of gravity on time. From the alien's perspective, the corresponding time interval for one wavelength, the period, is longer for the photon that climbed than for the photon produced at its level. But both photons were produced by exactly the same physical process. It's as if the alien's photon clock is running faster than the clock for the photon that originated deeper in the gravity field. Clocks, and therefore time, run slower the deeper you are in a gravity field. An effect predicted by Einstein in 1916 and finally confirmed experimentally in 1959 by Robert Pound and Glenn Rebka, who successfully measured this effect over a vertical height difference of 23 meters at Harvard University. The effect of gravity on time, combined with special relativity's time dilation due to relative velocity effect, has major implications for any users of GPS or SatNav satellite data. This includes the automatic rendezvous and docking systems on ESA's Automated Transfer Vehicle, or ATV. For ATV to successfully rendezvous with a moving target, the International Space Station, or ISS, it must be able to determine its own position continuously with incredible precision. A clock on a satellite orbiting the Earth 
is subject to two contrasting effects compared to one left on the ground. Special relativity, due to orbital velocity, would slow it down, while general relativity and increased distance from the Earth's gravity field center would make it run faster. And for GPS satellites, orbiting 20,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface and with a velocity of nearly four kilometers per second, it's general relativity that dominates. The overall effect is tiny. Over one whole day, the clock difference between a GPS satellite in orbit and a ground observer will be less than 40 microseconds. But the effect is cumulative. And unless accounted and corrected for, this effect would render the whole basis of GPS navigation useless. ATV's GPS systems use software that constantly correct for the craft's altitude and velocity through the application of both special and general relativity, enabling the centimeter levels of positional accuracy necessary for a successful rendezvous between cargo ship and space station, whilst both are orbiting at nearly eight kilometers per second. Each ATV docking is a superb example of how Einstein's theories of the nature of space, time and gravity successfully translate into operational reality for ESA's ISS program. The Italian physicist Eduardo Amaldi, born in Carpaneto Piacentino in 1908, was one of the first theoretical physicists in Italy. With a wide range of interests as diverse as atomic spectroscopy, gravity, cosmic rays, and nuclear physics, Amaldi's dedication to research and teaching was a major contribution to the development of European excellence across broad swathes of the physics landscape. And his commitment to the principle of collaborative research led to his pivotal roles in the formation of not only the Italian National Institute for Nuclear Physics, but also the European Organization for Nuclear Research, better known as CERN, and the European Space Research Organization, ESRO. ESRO was the forerunner from which ESA, the European Space Agency, was born in 1975, and more than three decades later, continued international collaboration led to the manufacturing and operation of ATV, the Automated Transfer Vehicle. ATV has had an essential role in maintaining operations on the International Space Station, ISS. But what challenges do such spacecraft face in order to operate in the harsh conditions of space? Many of them relate to space environment issues familiar to most of us. Being in a condition seemingly free of the familiar effects of gravity. Being in a virtual vacuum devoid of any meaningful atmospheric pressure and enduring significant temperature variation in a single 90-minute orbit. But some of the most challenging issues are those that are often overlooked at first glance. Cosmic rays and the solar radiation environment. Understanding the physics of these phenomena and the consequences for engineering structures orbiting the Earth is critical if ATV is to successfully perform its mission. In the early years of the 20th century, physicists measuring the rates of ionizations of gases in the atmosphere noticed that on successively higher balloon flights, the rates increased with altitude above Earth. A mysterious rain of high energy particles was bombarding our home planet, causing this ionization. And it was these landmark observations that led to the discovery of cosmic rays. 
So what are they? Emanating from deep space, cosmic rays are mainly high energy protons and helium nuclei, but also include much more massive particles such as the nuclei of heavier elements. In this cloud chamber demonstration, we can visualize some of the effects of cosmic rays. The thoriated rod we see is actually radioactive and emitting low energy alpha particles, helium nuclei. Being charged particles, these can ionize the air in the chamber, meaning that propanol vapor condenses along the path followed by the alpha particles, producing clearly visible contrails that appear to emanate from the rod. If we look carefully and wait, we can also see the occasional contrail appearing that has nothing to do with the rod. These are the paths of muons, subatomic particles with the same charge as an electron, but 200 times the mass. The muon trails that we see in the tank owe their origins to high energy cosmic rays protons this time, interacting with molecules in the Earth's atmosphere and producing short-lived intermediary particles, called pions, which then decay to form muons. Now the helium nuclei in cosmic rays are much more energetic than those produced by the thoriated rod, thousands or even millions of times more so. And as we'll see later, this can have far more serious consequences for the materials through which cosmic rays move. Whether the cosmic ray events are protons, helium nuclei, or heavier particles, they all come from deep space. But what are their origins? Some of these high energy intruders into our solar system were produced in supernova explosions the death throes of high mass stars at the ends of their lives. And these particles may have spent centuries or even millennia racing through space at velocities approaching the speed of light. Others have even more exotic and remote origins from beyond our own Milky Way galaxy, produced in some of the most intense high energy physics environments in the universe including the accretion disks of supermassive black holes at the center of other galaxies, during collisions between entire galaxies, and during the most powerful explosive events in the universe, gamma ray bursts. Whatever and whenever their origin, all cosmic rays share a common characteristic regardless of their species an extraordinarily high energy, and this is where the problems with cosmic rays lie. Cosmic rays can rip through the material with which they collide, disrupting their structure at molecular, atomic, and even nuclear levels. And closer to home, within our own solar system, there's another source of high energy radiation with the capacity for damaging levels of ionization, our sun. Streaming outwards in all directions from our home star is a continuous flow of high energy charged particles, protons and electrons also known as the solar wind. Our atmosphere can act to absorb some of these charged particles. And in addition, Earth has a magnetic field affording us critical protection. But how? Charged particles in motion constitute electric currents, and these are deflected by magnetic fields, the Lorentz force. In this way, our global magnetic field deflects much of the solar wind and cosmic rays away from a direct interaction with our upper atmosphere. But some of the particles are funneled by the Earth's magnetic field, impacting the upper atmosphere at high latitudes in the northern and southern polar regions, where their effect can be to produce spectacular displays of the northern and southern lights, the aurorae. Now, for a spacecraft such as ATV, there's no absorptive protection from an external atmosphere, 
and the magnetic field protection in low orbit is less than on the surface of the Earth. Now the source of the radiation doesn't matter. It's the effects that count. And for the sophisticated electronics at the heart of its operating systems, that damage can be catastrophic. Data corruption, destruction of electronic circuitry, charged particle interactions with silicon chips and electrical circuits have the capacity to cripple satellite mission capabilities. Radiation-hardened specialised electrical components, along with new techniques for data recovery, are essential to minimise these effects. And with humans on board a spacecraft, the stakes are even higher. The complex structure of DNA is incredibly susceptible to ionising radiation. And so, for a craft like ATV, which effectively becomes an extra space station module when docked to the ISS, protection for the crew from the effects of this type of radiation is critical. Like the rest of the ISS, ATV uses passive techniques for radiation protection. This provides sufficient protection for successful operations in low Earth orbit, meaning that ATV can successfully deliver on its missions of resupply and orbital reboost for humanity's space science laboratory, the ISS. But the next phase of human exploration will necessitate leaving the protection of Earth's magnetic field and traversing a far harsher radiation environment. This will be the next challenge for European engineers, developing new technologies and techniques necessary for ATV's derivatives. This will support its future role as an essential component of the international multi-purpose crew vehicle, MPCV, that will take humans once again into deep space, back to the moon, and further still perhaps, to an asteroid, or even, within the next two to three decades, to the planet Mars. Of all the theories proposed by astronomers to try and explain the observed features of our universe, none has captured the imagination more than the Big Bang. This model has transformed our understanding of the cosmos and the origins of space and time. And the father of the Big Bang was the Belgian astronomer Georges Lemaitre. Born in 1894 in Charleroi, Belgium, Lemaitre served as an artillery officer in the Belgian army during World War I and subsequently trained as both a priest and a physicist. It was Lemaitre's creative genius and vision that rewrote our understanding of the universe in a single theory that could explain phenomena observed beyond our own Milky Way. Phenomena which, in the early decades of the 20th century, were perplexing those astronomers who were struggling to understand both the scale and the history of the cosmos. For hundreds of years, observers had noticed seemingly cloudy regions of the night sky, nebulae. As the quality of visual, telescopic and photographic data improved, more and more details were resolved. Many of these nebulae seemed to show some type of spiral structure and, as is so often the case in science, two completely opposite explanations emerged as to their nature. To some, these clouds of dust and gas were thought to be relatively small phenomena located within our own Milky Way galaxy which, at the time, was assumed to be the extent of the whole cosmos. To others, however, the spiral nebulae were island universes, separate, vast collections of billions of stars like our own galaxy, but at enormous distances beyond it. 
how could astronomers choose between these two wildly different explanations? The key to understanding the nature of these nebulae is the technique of spectroscopy, based on the science of atomic physics. Every element in the universe is made up of atoms which consist of a central, positively charged nucleus, made up of protons and neutrons, and a corresponding number of negatively charged electrons orbiting around the nucleus. These electrons occupy a series of energy levels with the specific energies being unique to a given element. Electrons can change energy levels within an atom, but they can only do so by gaining or losing energy. And this can happen when the electrons interact with photons bundles of electromagnetic energy that make up what we think of as light. We can see that if an electron absorbs a photon with the correct energy, it will jump to a higher energy level. If, however, an electron which has previously been excited to a higher energy level drops to a lower available energy level, it will emit a photon which has an energy equal to the difference between those two electron energy levels. Either way, all of the possible energies, and therefore the wavelengths, of the photons emitted and absorbed by a given element are specific to that particular element. Spectroscopy is the technique using this principle by which we can use light from a source we observe to identify which chemical elements are present in the source. By splitting the received light into a rainbow or spectrum, we can break down that light into a sequence of individual wavelengths. Because of the possible energies allowed by absorption and emission processes for a given element, we will see either characteristic dark lines at wavelengths where high numbers of photons are being absorbed, or characteristic bright lines where high numbers of photons are being emitted. And these lines will be at specific positions in the spectrum. Each element has its own unique pattern of spectral lines, its own electromagnetic optical fingerprint. Now, if we compare the light being emitted by a star or a galaxy with reference light produced by different elements here in laboratories on Earth, we can match the patterns of the different features at different wavelengths and determine the chemical composition of objects in space. It's the astronomical equivalent of using fingerprint matches at a crime scene. But the potential of spectroscopy extends beyond just identifying the chemical composition of planets or stars or galaxies. In 1912, spectroscopic measurements of many of the spiral nebulae showed a redshift, a shift in the position of their characteristic spectral features caused by a stretching of their wavelengths. This observation suggested that the spiral nebulae were actually receding from us, getting further away from Earth. And measurements of the amounts of redshift could be used to determine their velocities of recession. As more observations were conducted on other spiral nebulae, further patterns of redshift were observed. It was as if we were located at the centre of an enormous expansion, with the nebulae flying apart in all directions. In parallel, observations of variable stars within the nebulae, coupled with the use of telescopes large enough to resolve individual stars within them, confirmed that they were, in fact, hundreds or even thousands of times more distant than
than the stars within the Milky Way, strongly suggesting that they were entirely separate galaxies, other island universes. How could these observations be interpreted? What could be causing all galaxies to be receding from us? Evidence was presented during the great 1920s debates on the nature of these measured redshifts, but it was Lemaitre's analysis, coupled with his familiarity with the general relativity theory of Einstein, that led him to a startling conclusion, one which would shatter the generally accepted notion that the universe was in a steady state, forever unchanging on cosmological scales. In 1927, he proposed that the only model which could explain these observations in the light of general relativity was that the entire universe was born from a single origin which he called the primeval atom. An explosive disruption of this origin sent material flying out in all directions. And it was from this material that the galaxies subsequently condensed. This model could explain the measured redshifts. From a single event in the distant past, the entire cosmos was born. Let's cover this sphere with small dots, each representing an individual galaxy. This, by the way, can be easily demonstrated with a balloon. If we now inflate the sphere, the separations between the galactic dots increase. And, from the perspective of any individual dot, all of the other dots are getting further away from it. It's as if that particular dot was the centre of the expansion. In this way, we can see how, from the perspective of each individual galaxy, this expansion would make it seem that every other galaxy was moving further away from it. In 1929, the American astronomer Edwin Hubble, building on the observations conducted by Vesto Slipher nearly two decades earlier, experimentally measured the redshift of nearly 50 galaxies and, plotting the velocities of the galaxies against their distance, discovered a pattern that emerged from the data, just as predicted by Lemaitre. The further away the galaxies were, the faster they were receding, but also the relation between their distances and recession velocities was linear and the constant of proportionality, now known as Hubble's constant, would, in principle, enable the age of the universe to be determined by simply reciprocating the constant. It would take nearly a decade before Lemaitre's ideas were generally accepted by cosmologists. Einstein graciously declared in 1933 that Lemaitre's theory was the most beautiful and satisfactory explanation of creation to which I've ever listened. But the renaming of Lemaitre's theory as the Big Bang came later still by the British astronomer Sir Fred Hoyle in a radio interview in 1949. Lemaitre's final vindication came 15 years later with the fortuitous discovery in 1964 by Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson of the cosmic microwave background radiation in which the entire universe is immersed. This is the final afterglow from the creation of the cosmos, now accepted to have occurred 13.7 billion years ago. This image shows the highest resolution map we currently have of the variations in the cosmic microwave background. It's a record of the time when the universe was only 380,000 years old. But, as is so often the case in science, as one mystery is solved, 
a new one emerges. Three decades after the discovery of the cosmic microwave background radiation, analysis of light from very high redshift galaxies, some of the furthest in the universe, seem to suggest that rather than slowing down, as might be expected, due to the mutual gravitational attraction between galaxies, the expansion of the universe is actually accelerating. A host of subsequent observations since 1998 have further confirmed that some mysterious force is driving apart the universe's constituents, and perhaps the structure of space-time itself. Given the name dark energy, this driving force is thought to make up nearly three quarters of the mass energy content of the universe. And, although there are many theories, no one has any firm idea as to what dark energy actually is. Is it a fifth fundamental force of nature? called quintessence, or perhaps a manifestation of Einstein's long-abandoned cosmological constant. Explaining the dark energy enigma is one of the biggest challenges in modern cosmology, and its resolution will be in the hands of the next generation of scientists, whose genius and vision will transform our understanding of the evolution of the cosmos once again. So great was Georges Lemaitre's redefinition of our understanding about the boundaries, origin and possible future of the universe that ESA, the European Space Agency, named its fifth automated transfer vehicle, or ATV, after this visionary of cosmology. ATV has boosted Europe's experience in sustaining operations on humanity's orbiting science laboratory the International Space Station, or ISS. ATVs have brought thousands of kilograms of water, oxygen, propellant and experimental supplies to sustain both life and science operations for multinational crews. ATV has been an essential contribution to the success of the ISS and with a future role for ATV's derivatives as the European service module of the spacecraft that will take humans beyond Earth orbit, perhaps the ultimate legacy of ESA's ATV program will be its contribution to the extending of the human race's frontiers, to destinations including the Moon, near-Earth asteroids, and perhaps ultimately even the planet Mars. If we journey back in time four centuries, Europe was undergoing an era of profound change and intellectual revolution. Just as the Renaissance was transforming the world of literature and the arts, so Johannes Kepler would transform the world of observational science. Born in 1571 in the German town of Weilderstadt near Stuttgart, the six-year-old Kepler saw the Great Comet of 1577, an event that was to shape the direction of his life's work and, as a result, the way in which humanity sees its own place in the universe. Inspired by this celestial spectacle, Kepler fell in love with physics and mathematics, convinced that by careful analysis of the stars and planets in the night sky, he could deduce the mathematical basis of the universe. For thousands of years, sky watchers had noticed that, although most of the stars seemed fixed in position, five, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn, were most definitely not. Traversing across the star fields in broad, curving paths, occasionally reversing in direction, these planetes, the Greek for wanderers, would provide the key to Kepler's discoveries and also the more familiar term, planets. By the 16th century, 
two conflicting explanations had emerged to try to decipher the celestial dances of the planets. The orthodox Ptolemaic model put the Earth at the centre of the universe, whilst the revolutionary Copernican model had dethroned the Earth and humanity from this central position, replacing it with the Sun. Arguments raged, but critically, both models relied on the idea of purely circular orbits. And they both seemed to work as alternative explanations of what was being seen. Almost, but not quite. Both the models used circular suborbits called epicycles to try to explain the observed motions of the planets in a desperate attempt to fit the circular model they believed in. But as observations became ever more detailed and precise, so the deviations grew. It was Johannes Kepler who broke the paradigm in 1605 and explored a new way of attempting to understand not only the motion of the planets, but also the trajectories of every object in the universe. But how? Nowhere was this problem more obvious than in trying to explain the observed motion of Mars. Kepler spent six years and thousands of pages of calculations, and his solution to the mystery of the red planet's orbit manifests itself in his three laws of planetary motion. Firstly, the orbit of Mars isn't a circle, it's an ellipse, with the Sun at one of its foci. Secondly, a line joining Mars to the Sun will sweep out equal areas in equal times. Furthermore, Kepler later realised that this didn't just apply to Mars, it applies to all the objects orbiting the Sun. So for a comet with a highly elliptical orbit, Kepler's second law means that as it approaches the Sun, it races inwards with an increasing velocity that then dramatically reduces as it returns to the cold depths of the outer solar system. Kepler's subsequent analysis of all the known planets led to the third of his laws. The square of the orbital period of a planet is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of its orbit. But what does that mean? Well, a planet closer to the Sun will not only orbit faster than an outer one, but its angular velocity will be greater. It'll race ahead along its orbital racetrack path, a discovery that successfully explained the Martian orbital mystery without any recourse necessary to the convoluted theory of epicycles. By the painstaking analysis of observational astronomical data, Kepler had unlocked the secrets of planetary motion decades before Sir Isaac Newton provided the ultimate proof of why through his universal law of gravitation. Many centuries later, it's the mastery of applying Kepler's three laws that enables the European Space Agency to launch its ATV or automated transfer vehicle, to rendezvous with the International Space Station. The five ATVs are named after European scientists and visionaries of space exploration, including Kepler. And each of these vehicles is launched from Europe's spaceport in Kourou, in French Guiana, aboard Ariane 5 rockets. After launch, each ATV spends more than a week catching up with the ISS in an outward spiral path over 4 million kilometres long, with velocity reducing as altitude increases, obeying Kepler's third law. Using its GPS and star trackers, ATV's onboard systems are aiming to intercept the orbit of the giant space station at an altitude of nearly 400 kilometres and a velocity of nearly 8 kilometres per second. And during this time, the ISS completes more than 100 orbits of the Earth. 
ATV makes its final approach to the station. It's onboard computers using a range of navigation systems to ensure a closure rate of less than 10 centimeters every second. With contact and capture complete, the 20 ton vehicle has fulfilled one of its primary objectives, the delivery of essential cargo and experimental supplies for the inhabitants of humanity's farthest outpost. But its orbital duties aren't over just yet. We often think of space as being a vacuum, but even at an altitude of 400 kilometers, there's a minuscule amount of atmosphere present, enough to cause a measurable drag force on the ISS. So what effect does this have? Well, from Kepler's and Newton's modeling, a reduction in orbital velocity causes a drop in orbital altitude. And in the time that I've been talking to you, that figure for the ISS is around 20 centimeters. Now that doesn't sound like much, but let's keep adding up the numbers. Over a day, the height drop is that of a 20 story building. Over a week, nearly half a kilometer. To counteract this orbital decay, ATV has a key role in preventing this through orbital reboost. By firing its engines in a series of extended burns, ATV accelerates the entire 420 ton mass of the station by an extra 70 kilometers per hour. After the reboost, ISS stabilizes into an orbit approximately 40 kilometers higher. And following Kepler's third law, its new orbital velocity is actually less than before the reboost. There's one final role for each ATV. And once again, it relies on the precision and application of Kepler's laws. During the many months that each ATV is docked with the ISS, its shirt sleeve pressurized environment, having been emptied of cargo, is progressively filled with waste material. ATV's final act is to unberth from the station and reduce its orbital velocity. The resulting drop in orbital altitude subjects it to ever increasing atmospheric drag. Ram air compression, often referred to as atmospheric friction, caused by its hypersonic velocity in the upper atmosphere, results in enormous aerodynamic, mechanical and thermal stresses. So much so that ATV's decaying orbit will eventually destroy the vehicle. The re-entry is targeted over remote areas of ocean to minimize any risk of debris damage. It's mission complete ATV's final breakup is a spectacular display, visible from both the surface of the Earth and the ISS itself. ATV's tasks are finally completed, thanks to the combination of Kepler's laws and European engineering excellence. As a visionary and dreamer, Jules Verne helped inspire a new generation of inventors and scientists to make their aspirations of space exploration a reality. Born in 1828 in the French town of Nantes, Verne's love for all matters nautical led him to speculate on explorations beyond the realm of 19th century experience in his Voyage Extraordinaire a sequence of 54 novels which included the possibilities of sailing the seas of space. The fourth book in the series, De la Terre à la Lune, From the Earth to the Moon, focused on the challenges of launching three intrepid explorers using a cannon across 400,000 kilometers of space with the ultimate goal of landing on the moon. Verne's solution to the problem of how to dispatch his heroic explorers to their celestial target involved an exploration of how objects fired with a single massive initial impulse would behave in gravitational fields.
the science of ballistics. Of the four fundamental forces of nature, including the strong nuclear, electromagnetic and weak nuclear, gravity, the mysterious force of attraction exerted by all masses on each other, is the weakest but it's the one that ultimately determines the large-scale structure of the universe. So what does Newton's equation for gravity tell us? The force of gravitational attraction between the spacecraft, there, and I, here, is less than one one-hundred-thousandth of a Newton. So it's hardly surprising that most of the tiny attractive forces exerted by everything around us in our everyday lives are overwhelmed by the force of Earth's gravitational attraction on us. And that's what we know as our weight. In my case, nearly 900 newtons. Gravity is a force that, in spite of many misconceptions, certainly exists in space. Using Newton's equation, we can actually calculate that raising an apple from the surface of the Earth to the altitude of the International Space Station, ISS, only reduces its weight by around 10%. Gravitational forces actually extend to infinity, following an inverse square law and diminishing with distance, but never completely disappearing. So why do objects in the space station appear to be weightless? It's because the station and everything on it are constantly falling towards the Earth, accelerating, because of gravity, at the same rate. They are, in fact, all on a path that follows the curvature of the Earth. Newton first modelled this idea in 1728 by imagining a cannon on top of a very high mountain, a cannon which fires a ball horizontally. The cannonball will follow a curved path, a ballistic trajectory. And we can also see that if the correct horizontal velocity is imparted to the cannonball, it will follow a curved path which precisely matches the curvature of the Earth's surface. The ball would be in orbit, in a state of constant freefall. Now, since gravitational fields accelerate all masses equally, if the cannonball was hollow, then all the occupants inside would be following exactly the same path, with no relative motion between them. Replace the idea of a hollow orbital cannonball with the International Space Station and the result? Everything on the station appears to float, but they're actually constantly falling. So what are the implications of gravity for Verne's cannon? An object fired at an angle with an initial velocity will follow a ballistic trajectory in a gravity field. It's a curved path that we call a parabola. Now, if we discount the effect of atmospheric drag to simplify the modelling, the precise shape of the trajectory and how far it finally ascends ultimately depends, for a given gravity field, on its launch velocity and its initial angle. As the object follows this ballistic path upwards, its kinetic energy will reduce, converting into potential energy as it works against the gravitational force of the Earth trying to pull it downwards. Although not a physicist, Verne correctly calculated that an object fired from Earth with a velocity of 11 kilometres per second, that's a speed that would take us from London to Paris in less than 35 seconds, such an object would have the capability of reaching the moon. Verne's solution of how to impart this colossal initial speed to the spacecraft carrying his explorers was the construction of a giant gun barrel, the Columbiad, 270 metres long and 18 metres in external diameter. Verne's explorers would ride in a 20-ton hollow projectile just under 3 metres in diameter to which the Columbiad would impart the velocity needed 
to fire it to the moon in a single giant blast. The exploits of Verne's fictional heroes captured the imagination of the general public and scientists alike. But although his works inspired many, more detailed analyses of his proposed method highlighted its limitations. Within 10 years of Verne's publication, the father of Russian rocketry, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, recognised that the Columbiad would produce a crushing acceleration, many thousands of times that due to Earth's gravity, and hundreds of times higher than that endured by any astronaut. This would have resulted in the deaths and possible literal flattening of the occupants. Yet he was sufficiently inspired to begin his own speculations on how to make such a voyage survivable and practical. His solution? An inverted cannon on which the projectile itself was mounted. Now instead of a short powerful blast, Tsiolkovsky's cannon would have a much longer burn time. In the case of a ground cannon firing, the projectile is fired upwards, with the entire cannon structure recoiling in the opposite direction. But in Tsiolkovsky's design, gases are expelled downwards and the entire vehicle recoils upwards. The extended burn spreads out the time over which the momentum changes. In Tsiolkovsky's design, the change of momentum is spread out over a much longer period of time, thus reducing the resulting accelerations to survivable values. Now, any human occupants would experience the discomfort of a few times their effective weight for as long as the engines are firing, but this is much better than the crush of a thousand G acceleration produced by Verne's proposed Columbiad gun barrel. The empty rocket stages are discarded once used to minimise dead weight and maximise the effect of engine thrust. And in this way, inspired by Verne, Tsiolkovsky paved the engineering pathway for multi-stage rocket acceleration to whatever target and velocity would be required, whether to voyage to the moon or, closer to home, to rendezvous with a space station orbiting the Earth. ATV, ESA's automated transfer vehicle, relied on precisely these rocketry principles to carry out its mission in delivering essential cargo to the International Space Station. ATV is launched from Kourou, Europe's spaceport in South America. The 760-tonne Ariane expels thousands of kilograms of exhaust gases every second at supersonic speed powering ATV upwards to an initial orbital altitude of over 250 kilometres and a velocity approaching 8 kilometres per second. From this orbit, ATV will use its own propulsion and guidance systems to close in on the station. The entire launch sequence from Kourou to low Earth orbit takes less than 10 minutes, a spectacular engineering testament to the inspirational vision of Jules Verne. I guess you're about the only person around that doesn't have TV coverage of the scene. That's alright, I don't mind a bit. Okay, you got the flag up now and you can see the stars and stripes on the window. Are you getting a TV picture now, Houston? Neil, yes, we are getting a TV picture. You're in our field with you now. That's one small step for man. One giant leap.